All right, my name is uh, Courtney Oz, and I'm an associate professor here at UF, and I work out of the lab in Fort Pierce. Um, interrupt for one yes. second. We don't have a printout for this one. I apologize. We'll blame the printer. So, <laughs> yeah, so we're going to start with the um, so we started working with uh, schools in 2009. And so I'm going to be giving entertaining three talks today or two and a half talks. So um, the first one is about recirculating systems. So I have a question. How many people have ever maintained an aquarium? All right. So how many of you have larger recirculating systems already in schools? And how big is one? Hey, let's go. Um, 100 gallons of one. All right, so we got some. All right, so this will be a review for a lot of you, um, but I'm going to cover a lot of the different components of recirculating systems. So I'm going to introduce you to the basic components in uh, recir uh, recir recirculating aquaculture systems or RAFs. I'm going to show you uh, some large uh, recirculating systems, and I'll show you some of the small ones that are typically used in classes. So recirculating systems have been developed because uh, you really reduce the water usage. Um, you're allowed to keep it in a controlled environment where you have year-round production. Uh, you can put it within existing buildings and you push the system to raise the maximum amount of fish if you're doing this commercially. And so uh, you, you get high yields per gallon. Um, the feed conversions, how much you feed a fish, how much they eat, and how much they grow from that food is the feed conversion. And so it's much uh, uh, um, more efficient within a tank system than it is a pond because the food doesn't disperse everywhere. Uh, you have much more control, but they cost money. They can be complex, especially these really large ones I'll show you. Um, some of the components can be very expensive and uh, you have to manage your water quality. And there's uh, some inefficiencies in, in the different systems that you can use. So this is a, a schematic. So you have this uh, um, a fish culture tank, but you have all of these different issues that you have to deal with. And the first one is aeration. You obviously need the fish to have aeration. You have to have a biological filtration, which removes um, all of their waste. And all of these other components are, are necessary within the system. And I'll, I'll cover each one of these individually. There's lots of different types of tanks. Typical one is a round one. There's octagonal ones, there's square ones, there's D end ones that typically have a, a wall in the middle and it moves water. It's like a U shape. Um, and uh, what you do is in, in you're trying to push the amount of pounds that you can do within these systems. And so it typically is like a third to a half of a pound of fish per gallon that you can raise in this if your recirculating systems are efficient. So aeration. Um, most use atmospheric uh, air where they uh, force in through a blower system like this. There's a pointer on this. On the top? Yeah, I think so. There would be a little light. Yeah. Oh, there we go. <laughs> so that, will show up, that pointer will show up on the Zoom as well. Wow. All right. Um, so. <laughs> So most people use a blower system like that. On a smaller system, you would have uh, one or two aeration devices that was forcing air within the system. Um, if you get really complex and you're pushing these systems to a maximum, you're going to be using things like pure oxygen. You're going to use like uh, uh, double flow contactors to maximize the amount of oxygen that you can force into that. Um, you're not going to be doing that in your schools, but this is all introducing you to the components that takes it to the large commercial scale. So then the next main thing you have to do is remove all of the fish waste, the nitrogenous waste. And uh, it's done in multiple different ways. Uh, you have fluidized bed filters. And let's see, that is this one right here. And basically there is a sand or another type of a particle within that that's constantly moving. And that provides um, the surface area for bacteria. And we'll, we'll get to explaining all that in a few slides. But Basically, all you're doing with all these filters is you're making a surface area for the bacteria um, to survive. This is a rotating um, biocontactor. It's rotating, and all those screens there have the places where uh, the bacteria colonizes it, and it actually goes in the water and then comes back out, and that's aerating that bacteria. Um, this is the most common one. This is a 
That's the bead filter right there. And uh, so there's a uh, little plastic beads or different materials that are within it and it's constantly moving. And as long as that's constantly moving, then all the surface area on the, that uh, uh, material within the filter then is the surface area for the bacteria to, to grow on. If it gets clogged, then there's problems. It's not all getting uh, um, good aeration. And so what you're doing in all these is you're, you're maximizing the health of your bacteria to remove all your fish waste. Um, these are some larger bead filters. Uh, the ones you'll be getting, like I said, are a smaller version that looks just like those. With lots of different types. These are uh, uh, different prop wash ones. Um, these are some massive fluidized bed filters. Um, this one right here um, was sand about that deep, and all these are air injectors that's just taking that sand and constantly moving it within it. Super efficient for filtration systems. But if the sand settles, your bacteria starts to die. So there's lots of maintenance and things with that. Um, it gives you another idea of a, a, of a large scale commercial fluidized bed filter on the other side. It also has a prop wash filter with it there. Complex systems uh, pushing the maximum that you can out of uh, the production out of, out of your water. Um, this is about my favorite. Um, it's expensive, it's uh, poly geysers. And if you were starting and you had um, unlimited money, I would buy these. One of the reasons is because um, they don't take a lot of maintenance and cleaning and backwashing. These are all uh, done with uh, like their bubble washes. So it, it, it blows air within it and it takes all the uh, fragments, all the stuff out of it. And then that's collected very easily and without much water. Um, a lot of these others, you have to backwash it. And when you do, you're using a, a, a significant amount of water within your system. This one, it's very efficient for water usage. Um, you'll see some of those in, when we take a tour tomorrow of the labs out here. So this is what you're doing. You are taking fish waste, ammonia, and you have this bacteria called nitrosomonas, and it is oxidizing ammonia into nitrite. And nitrite is much less toxic than ammonia. Ammonia is highly toxic to a fish. And so you're converting it to one that is less toxic. Then there's another type of bacteria and it is uh, nitrobacter. And again, you are oxidizing, adding oxygen and you're going to nitrate. Nitrate is not really toxic. Um, it takes a whole lot of it, so it can accumulate in a system and it's not going to hurt your fish uh, like the other ones will. Um, you have to keep both bacteria nice and happy, and you do that by aeration, and you do that by making sure that all the surface area that bacteria is living on within that filter is healthy um, or it can be colonized. So what am I adding right here? You can see that. I have an O2 and I have an O2. So oxygen, this whole system has to have a lot of oxygen in order for it to work. Um, some biofilters, so if there's a clogging of the biofilter or something occurs and there's a lack of oxygen, your bacteria population can be harmed and it can, it, it can occur pretty quickly. Um, I mentioned those large fluidized bed filters where if it just settles out for a period of time, that bacteria, your, your high population of bacteria is going to be injured by ha not having oxygen. And it takes a little while to, to uh, reestablish. So this is a, what, what an initial biofilter break-in would look like. You have ammonia and you have, so you've seeded it with bacteria and you are trying to grow this bacteria. So you take the ammonia and it rises, and as its uh, bacteria, nitrosomonas grows, then it starts to decline because it's being converted, and then you're making nitrate, nitrite, excuse me. And then the nitrate continues to increase, and as this bacteria kicks in, it starts going down, and then your nitrate increases. Really, the only way to get it out is like a water change or uh, use it for plants within the system or other things like that. There's different ways to get the nitrate out. Um, but one of obvious one is a water change, but plants will do a pretty good job as well. Any questions on this? Because this is critical for a biofilter. This is the purpose. All right. Um, 
So some tricks, you have to keep even flow over all of your media and you have to keep it nice and moving and aeration, oxygen is necessary. Yes. Oh yeah, yeah, go. Um, like I built my own little system, well, my classroom, but I right. found that the water flow back to the tank, if I raised the piping level to give it almost like water, like a waterfall right would add isn't that like a natural type of aeration? aeration sure absolutely so some of the filters there's a trickle filter which is just basically plastic media of some kind that water trickles down through and that does the same thing it oxygenates it by just trickling through it where there's air and water splashing as it goes through so when we get these systems do we have the ability to like Customize them, or, or is it already built? Like, oh if no, we did no, a, no, we are handing you a bunch of components, and you guys get to put them together at your school. Yes. So we are, yeah. We'll, we'll, and you'll on day three, there'll be a much more kind of step by step through the components you have. Yeah, you're just saying we're working on it, but you can absolutely customize it. However, you know, there's a lot of add-ons you could do to the yeah, system. You're yes. You're welcome to to customize. Yeah, he pointed out um, the filter that you guys will be getting. We talked about it a little bit, but yeah, we'll talk about it more on day three. Yeah, specific. B filters so are the most common. They're yeah. great. They're good. You just can't let them get clogged up. You gotta get. You have to remove the materials, and so there's the bacteria if that's living on all the beads within is is healthy. That's and the one of the main tricks. Yeah. One of one of the you know the goals for this program for you all to to have this experience and, and learn and, and apply your, you know, your knowledge you have to the system. We're not giving you a hard and fast, this is what you have to do. And we want to hear about your experience, you know, show us, show us pictures of how you customize the system and tell your, tell your colleagues, you know, that are here about what you're doing too, and maybe they can adapt that. So all those kinds of things we definitely encourage. So yeah, sorry. Yeah, that's good. Um, let's see, so aeration. Um, you also have to keep the water buffered. Um, and that most of the water naturally has uh, bicarbonate within it. And that is all uh, helps you maintain your bacteria population. As your pHs change, you as pHs go down, you have to add sodium bicarbonate. Just arm and hammer sodium bicarbonate. You can also sell it in 50 pound bags if you want it. And you have to add that back in to maintain your pH in a range where that chemical reaction I showed you is efficient all the way through that process. And we will see ammonia start climbing in a tank and we're like, what's going on? We'll look and our pH in a marine system is, is going down under, a, it's at seven, five, and we'll just take like a big cup full, throw it in the system and the next day it'll be fixed. So you have to maintain that as well. It's just another one of the things that you have to do to keep your bacteria happy. Um, so I always do this as an aquaculture 101 because I've learned the lesson the hard way many times and I've made mistakes. So you do something wrong and you kill your bacteria. What do you do? It can take two weeks or more to recolonize. recolonize. So we started one of these uh, uh, exercises that's in the uh, curriculum we'll go over later. And it's uh, uh, starting a biofilter and you'll start to see that process there. And so what I do in my own lab is I have these foam pieces in those tanks and every one of those could run an entire huge system. There's so much happy bacteria on there. There's all kinds of surface area. It has 10 air stones going in there. And we take a teaspoon of ammonia chloride and pour it straight into it each every day. And it just eats it up. It'll just be nitrite and nitrate quick. And so I keep this nice, happy. I, I probably have 100 independent systems at my lab at the other place. And something always goes wrong. Somebody, they're marine. And so somebody pours fresh water in and it goes straight in and it kills the bacteria. Well, the bacteria was saltwater bacteria and you just hit it with a big wash of fresh water. All of a sudden, oh, I don't have bacteria anymore. My fish are going to be suffering. Well, I grab a sponge. I put it on top. It just reseeds it overnight. So th there's, it'll save things, okay? <laughs> and you just do it in a little 10 gallon aquarium off to the side. You also can do it like in a barrel or a bucket, all of those. You, and you maintain it to keep that bacteria happy.
Um, we can add our two cents in on that. Um, yeah. So our aquaponic system at FX has had two bacteria crashes in the last year. It happens. It, okay? happens. it happens. It will happen. Bacteria is the most yeah. sensitive, okay? And if it happens, it will kill your fish if you can't fix it. So not required, the fish, but I wish we had that. That would have been nice. Uh, yeah. So I, watch I, yeah. Water changes every five minutes. Yeah. yeah. So fish is... A fish is much tougher than bacteria. And so it doesn't take much is what I'm getting at is it doesn't take much to kill your bacteria. And then if your bacteria dies, you have an issue and then your fish can't, you can't process the waste and they're sitting there in their own waste. And so that's the idea of a recirculating system is you're doing that. Um, another thing you can have, especially in huge production things where you're maximizing the production is you're throwing a lot of feed in. So you're gonna get sediments, you're gonna get, um, solid feces by some fish tilapia are classic for them and all of those are going to have to be removed and there's lots of different ways um there's sediment ponds sedimentation flow tanks the aquaponic system within uh, most of these is a good place for some settlement to occur um a swirl separator is uh, uh, it's, it's one of my favorites but they're hard to maintain you keep the flow going within a barrel and it's basically a, a tornado and it takes everything solid and sits out and the water's discharged out of the top. And then you go and you just open the bottom up and you drain out a, a bunch of solids that's, a, a, that's come out of a system. Um, drum filters, they're expensive. They're not my favorite, they gotta be clean, but basically they have a screen on them that they rotate and they take the solids out. Um, bead filters, your bead filter will remove solids and it will accumulate in there and it's just fine to do that, but you have to make sure those solids aren't there where it hurts the bacteria living on your beads. So you do a backwash and you remove a bucket of water and you put a new bucket of water in. Um, and then a double drain design is another one. It, it helps uh, on the settlement processes. Um, I, I, I thought about this a little while ago and I did put it in a slide, but. Um, when you replace water, and we never talk, I never talked about dechlorinating and things like that in here, and I don't know if it, any of it's in there, and where, what your water source is going to be, um, because uh, a lot of tap water will have chlorine in it, and it'll kill a fish real quick, so you have to remove that chlorine, um, and you can use it with an air stone, and it'll remove it all if you give it time. It'll probably take 24 to 48 hours with heavy aeration to remove it. Or you can use something called sodium thiosulfate. It's a salt and it's very inexpensive and you can add that in and it'll dechlorinate your water instantly. So on that note, Put a note reiterating on the what he just said, I know you guys just have unlimited supplies of money, right? It's <laughs> cheap. Teachers. That is cheap. But if you just plan ahead, wait 48 hours like you could just aerate a bucket of water before you do your water change or several buckets yes. of water leave it for 24 to 48 hours boom dechlorinate it you don't need to spend money on something to dechlorinate your water just just to reiterate what you said. our drinking water has plenty of chlorine in it to kill a fish within mm -hmm. an hour yeah. <laughs> so uh, you have to think about that when you remove it um then so those are the ones that, that i just showed you that remove the big particles then within a system, you get these spines that are real small that those filter those filter components don't take out. Um, this is a protein skimmer or a foam fractionator. And what it does is it uses microfine air bubbles within this tube, and it's down here, and it's, and it's raising it up. And basically, the little air bubble is attached to these little tiny particles and take it to the surface, and then it's skimmed out. And you get this delicious looking dark green stuff that discharges out and you get it collected. They work super efficiently. You can build them in a, uh, and yourself or you can pay to have one built. And uh, uh, they're a, a very crude one would use a wood air stone or some sort of a, a micropore uh, ceramic stone. And uh, other ones use a, a venturi valve, which is very inexpensive and you have air comes in the top and it shoots through and it makes a super tiny mist of, of uh, air bubbles that takes all this stuff out. Um, you need to control bacteria if you're in these huge systems and UV sterilizers are probably the most commonly used uh, uh, piece of equipment. So within these tubes, there is a, an ultraviolet light bulb 
that's in a, a casing of glass and the water passes on the outside and the light bulb uh, then irradiates that water as it passes on the outside of where the bulb is, is protected from being touching the water. And then um, lots of the large places use ozone. Uh, it's much more complicated. So then you have lights, backup power. Um, make sure that you're not pushing the amperage on whatever your one breaker is. Put a pump on this breaker and something else on this breaker and know where your two plugs are and what and how they work. That's always a good one because if you're pushing most of your breakers in your buildings are going to be 20 amps and you might be pushing 10 plus. And if you have something else plugged into it, you got to watch that because if you're sitting right at that 20, it might trip a breaker and then you come in and there's nothing there. Some sort of an alarm system that lets you know some sort of a there's all different types of things that you could do um, to prevent a catastrophe or know that one of those is occurring or could occur. Um, I have automated phones that call me and it never fails at three o'clock in the morning. I hear the stupid thing ringing. I'm like, look, and it says farm and I'm looking at it and this mechanical guy talking to me in this computer language telling me your systems in the greenhouse have no water in them. And I'm like, oh, no. It's <laughs> always 3 a.m. It, it, it's always, it's always. And when I'm on vacation and I'm trying to like call somebody else from somewhere else, I'm like, hey, we got a problem. Um, so there's a lot of automated feeders, automatic feeders, some very inexpensive ones. There's some uh, lots of different designs that will time it out. There's a simple belt driven ones. There's all sorts of very inexpensive automatic feeders that allow you to get consistent feeding to your fish. And in your case, those are called students. It's students. But <laughs> so one of the things that we ran into with teachers is maintaining this like during breaks mm -hmm. and maintaining it. And teachers don't always work during the summers and things like that. So all of these type of things can be added on so the fish can continue through the summers and that kind of thing by having very inexpensive automatic feeders and having a student come in once versus feeding it multiple times a day, like set it up so it would be fed for a couple of days and on one of these automatic feeders. Um, computerized water quality, obviously you're probably not all gonna have that. And, uh, but, but a lot of these really large systems do. I guarantee you this system has all of those. <laughs> um, this is an outdoor one. This used to be hybrid striped bass and now they raise uh, algae for biofuels. And uh, it's in, uh, outside of Palm Springs, California in the desert. And it was the largest hybrid striped bass production facility in the country. And now they're raising biofuel. Um, this is uh, their inside hatchery. So these are um, bead filters and they're an older design. And this is a massive facility. I believe this is tilapia. And this is, if I'm wrong, I, I don't think I'm wrong. I think it's actually North Dakota. <laughs> it's somewhere where a tropical fish is now inside of a warm building. Mm -hmm. And this is a lot of fish being produced there. It's one of the larger ones up in the northern Midwest, and they're all shipped to Canada live. Gives you an idea of the size of this operation. Um, this is the inside of Atlantic Sapphire in Homestead. This is uh, the salmon farm. Um, we mentioned it earlier. So they're raising a cold water species in Homestead, the most Southern part of Florida. Like, what are they doing? And it's all indoors and it's uh, temperature regulated. And the company is also, uh, 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 the company is out of Norway. It's one of the largest salmon producers in the world. They also have alternative power type of things, solar um, and uh, all sorts of uh, efficient power things that they're using. And they also have a massive company that's done for chilling buildings. So they've incorporated all of these things into this facility and in, in allowing them to be in the hottest part of Florida raising a cold water species. Um, They've had some growing pains with recirculating systems. I don't know the exact details, but they have produced and they are continuing to produce. And, and uh, um, all of the technologies that they put there, they feel very confident are gonna continue to do good. Uh, how many millions of pounds do they wanna raise? Like 1.5 million pounds or something yeah, like that? Yeah, probably can you answer that? I don't know. A lot. A lot. A lot. And a lot. start to finish in the facility, start to finish. Why do you say that's one of the most common 
purchase fish in the U.S. And they're aiming for a third of all the plants. They want to supply it all. So what they do is they take they take a, a, a fish raised in Norway. The markets are in the United States. They process it and they package it. They send it on an airplane to ship it here. And then it gets distributed. So it's three days before it hits a plate anywhere in the United States. And by putting it in the United States, they can have it on your plate in 24 hours. And they won't have the shipping cost on the airplane across the country, or across the, the Atlantic. So that's one of the reasons that they're moving it here. Yeah, the issue is getting large groups and there is a problem because their biosecurity is intense. Yes. It's intense. So we we had a whole group that was going to go through and COVID hit. So I haven't been through it. And the picture you saw earlier that Charlie had, that was the before they put the roof on it. So it's all completely enclosed. You, those pictures were taken where you're looking and it's all enclosed now. Um, this is Aquaco. Um, it's in Fort Pierce. They raised Pompano. They just had their first tank of red snapper that they're raising. Um, they have put out a, a quite a bit of Pompano. They do a great job marketing them. They are in many, many white collar rest or white tablecloth restaurants all over the entire country. They do a great job distributing them. Um, it's, a, it's a very good, clean process. Um, and they are diversifying to additional species. And, and so they they have red snapper. And University of Miami has worked with spawning red snapper. We're one of the first ones to do it on sort of a commercial scale. And uh, so they uh, have been putting these all different places. And so this is one of their, their uh, contracted initial grow outs. And from what I understand, everything seems good. And they're, they're about that big now. <laughs> um, I'll show you, I, I have it on another slide. I'll, I'll, I'll see if the, uh, the video will play on a different one. All right. So, very simple systems. These were done by the Southern Regional Aquaculture Center, uh, Dave Klein at Auburn. And they put these in a lots of different schools. Um, simple system. And they basically had uh, a culture tank, um, a sump, a biofilter media, and, and it flowed through. And there was some solids removal with the screens on top of the bucket and it, and it wrote to, and it basically just flows through. Simple. Um, this is what the system looks like completed. And um, there's obviously was that this works if you don't push the system to the max. And many of you probably use something similar to this. Um, when you take a step up, then you have um, a, a rotating biofilter on this one on the top. And um, this is one of the fish farm systems. Uh, I, that's not aquaponics, that's just the sun and the settling on the sides. Um, this is uh, a little more advanced, the Fish Farm 2 system um, with uh, uh, added filtration components to it. This is somewhat similar to what you're going to have. You, we are, we're our own design or their own design, not <laughs> mine, but um, it, it's going to be somewhat similar to this. Then Lots of people put aquaponics within it and float racks on that. There's lots of different plants that you could raise in these. And uh, that's the next talk, I think. Um, this is adding more components to it, um, more automated with control. All of these are available as you want to add on. Um, Pent Air Aquatic Ecosystems is where we've always purchased these from. They have these. Other places have them. Um, these are two places that you're going to be ordering things and there's they will get it to you within 24 hours overnight it to you and then um, it, uh, the Florida Tropical Fish Farmers Association has a co-op store and they sell a lot of components as well so these are two very important contacts for you getting supplies and things for everything you do. I think that's the last one. Um, that information, I know you guys are like frantically scribbling right now. We'll, it's all, added, we'll, we'll have it all for you. We'll be added to our teacher resources links. So all of the links and stuff like that that they share will be in a document accessible through the Google Classroom. Yes, <laughs> all right, so that's the last one. Questions? I don't know how much time I have. I'll just talk fast. Hello? Yeah, no, we got about 10 minutes, and I have a couple of questions chat as well. Perfect.
Is it the liquid form or the dry form? So it keeps it up. The bacteria, most of it stays alive and it's more inactive by making it cool. So when you put it back in the proper conditions, not 100% of it is going to be alive, but it's going to reseed itself quickly and it reproduces quickly. So as long as some of that within the bottle is there, it's not going to slow down the process more than a day or two to reseed it. Um, if you took it and you put it into really bad conditions, left it in a hot barn, and it boiled, they're all dead and they're not coming back. <laughs> that, that kind of thing. So you're basically, you're putting it into a conditions where you're, you're trying to keep the majority of it alive. And they actually, when they send that, they have it in big, they, they bottle it right as they send it. So when you get it, it's supposed to be pretty fresh. Although we've had it lots of different ways. And I'll tell you from my experience, at least with Marine, ones that we seed it with, I'd say probably 50% of the time, the second bacteria is slower to take than it, the nitrosomonas. The, the ammonia to nitrite bacteria works really well. And the second one, the nitrobacter, does not do very well in the starter bottles. And that's one of the reasons we introduced the maintaining a bio filter in a little 10 gallon tank and feeding it every day, because then we had both types that were really active. And, I can't tell you why that is, but it occurs all the time, at least in green. So um, it's going to be talked about a little bit in the next presentation about starting a biofilter. There is a, an SARC document in your folder yep. about this. Um, so while you can, again, buy starter, if you don't want to buy starter, you don't have to. There's this stuff exists. It will find the ammonia, it will find the nitrite and colonize your systems. Just you have to give it time. So again, let's talk about a little bit in the next presentation. I really need you to pay attention to how much time it takes. Okay, because that's a good way to kill a bunch of fish. Is if you try and push your biofilter before it started, and then you add a bunch of fish to the system, and then you quickly watch them die. So we're gonna try and avoid that. Please pay attention. But yeah, you can buy the starter. Some of it works well. Some of it's a little niche. So you have twenty aquariums, and you're reseeding one of them. Just, the bacteria in one next to it is mm -hmm. very active usually, and that would help you see it as well. Fifty-five gallon going, and I am actually thinking rocks. Yep, anything out of that. Right. Another type of that's that's right. How we start in our yep. other system. Any way you can seed it with the proper bacteria, and then. Over. I always wondered if that's like the filter. Um, yes, <laughs> but like I said, I've had yeah. issues with it. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, you had a question, yeah. Aeration versus reducing the O2 with the plants, the fish, and the bacteria all taking oxygen. At what point, like capacity, does that become a problem? Like they're not being enough oxygen naturally. So you measure your oxygen and see where it is. Okay. Um, you're looking for five parts per million. Before like anybody that. gets concerned, well past what we're going to have you guys doing, <laughs> the, the bubbler will be fine. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it'll 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 handle it. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, if you're talking about more intense systems, yeah, I get it. I was just wondering size-wise, amount of fish, like where yeah. does it become more feasible to do the infusing versus just the aeration? Or so is there a limit to how much? You yeah, you can push a lot of fish with just aeration if you're putting in plenty of aeration. Um, you don't have to use oxygen until you have hundred thousands of pounds and that's just yeah, so yeah, yeah. thing. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, it's another good way to, like an emergency situation, say all powers out or something. If you had an O2 bottle, you could put a tiny air stone in there. And the, the efficiency of pure oxygen versus what atmospheric air is, one air stone in a little bottle, I have that as, those as emergencies will keep things alive for a long period of time. Too. So break into your CPR kit. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, okay. So we had a couple questions on the chat sure. here, Courtney, too. So what is the target PPM of nitrate? That is on the next presentation. Next Good. presentation. Okay, stay tuned, or Rachel. Courtney, or Courtney it, can it, say it. It, it will <laughs> rise, and it's not bad. Some of my systems will easily have 200, which is really high. Um, and uh, 
if you can get that down, great with water changes or plants, but uh, it's just not toxic to the fish. Yeah, it, it can cause issues. It, it but can yeah, cause it, takes a it can cause algae blooms and it can cause other things within your systems that you don't want. Yeah. Because you're putting the fertilizer there, but a lot of my systems um, get pretty high. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you guys, uh, like, so our Tar target, do, that's the point of the plants. Target, uh, I don't know. If you were at 50, I, I would be happy with 50. <laughs> yeah. So one of the other questions here was, would you not recommend reverse osmosis to prep water? Before, I think this question popped up when you were talking about um, chlorine, chlorine, chlorine and tap water. Um, so, all right, good question. RO water is commonly used and you mix then marine salt back in and then you use them in a coral reef aquariums type of things. If you're using pure RO water only in a fish tank, it can uh, reduce the number of minerals within the water and the fish then has osmoregulation issues. So adding a small amount of uh, ions back into that, um, the major ones are salt and potassium, uh, magnesium, mm -hmm. carbon. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why you're adding some bicarbonate. Um, freshwater fish can live with a small amount of salt and they need a tiny amount of salt in that water um, that's naturally there. So, and that's um, also going to mess with the aquaponic side of it too. So if you add the yeah. plants and everything, you're taking all of everything out of the water. You're right? taking it all out? Yeah, well, with the RO system. Mm -hmm. like, right. Yeah, so your plants, plants will have nothing and you will have to it. supplement the entire system. RO water is commonly used in marine systems, but you're adding back in salts after you only take this pure water. So, mm -hmm. Other... Take a couple questions from in the room. We have a couple more on the chat and time we'll get to those. We have plenty of time. Okay, let's jump back to the chat. Can the waste solids be used for anything or an other application when removed, like a fertilizer? Excellent. Excellent question. And I would actually throw this one to the room, folks in the room. I see some people nodding. Yeah. Anybody, anybody want to talk about that, their own experience? Yes. Um, and when I rinse out the filters, I have to use the bucket and then I water my gardens. Yeah, my perfect. So yeah, I, so I'm gonna. I'm, I'm, I'll be yeah. the one that puts an asterisk on this, though. Hello, hi. Um, there are regulations when it comes to serving your kids' produce out of your gardens. Um, so, <laughs> um, while it is a great idea, because um, I mean it's free fertilizer, yes. right? It's free fertilizer. So if you have uh, garden beds and stuff like that at your school on top of the system we're giving you, right? So we're giving you a little garden bed that's raised. If you have like round ones, use it, put it on the ground, put it on the soil, put it on the, like as far down as you can. This is also there are, and there's information in your packets and stuff like that. Make sure you're washing hands, make sure you're washing produce really well, all that kind of stuff. Because if you look at FNW and a lot of the um, like USDA and the recommendations for serving produce out of your school gardens, they recommend absolutely zero animal waste. Um, there's a bigger difference when it comes to terrestrial animals and all of that kind of stuff. But yeah, just make sure you're being safe about it. Better option if you're worried about putting animal waste on your uh, garden, uh, and flower bed, stuff like that. And make, grow some other things that you're not going to eat, but it'll look pretty, you know, but you're still using the free fertilizer. And, and the relationship with the aquaponics system, yeah. which we'll get to in future presentations, also gets to yeah. that, right? And it's essentially acting as a fertilizer. Something. Yeah, it's a great question. There was a comment here on the chat um, that, that um, Rachel, thank you, Rachel. Um, she said, we have an environmental club with students that earn volunteer hours for maintaining our system even during school break. So tip, tip. <laughs> wait, wait. Thank you. Thank you for the tip. <laughs> So that's a great, that's a great tip. Environmental club, marine science club, all those kinds of clubs are great. Maybe you have a 4-H, you know, all those are great um, kind of thing. Um, let's see, next, I, so the last question on the chat, do air stones work in saltwater aquariums? I'm not familiar with air stones. Is that something that can be easily found? Air stones, yes, very yeah. easily found. Yeah. And yes, but pet they will stores, be, right? Just your typical uh, you, pet yes, store. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. In all and they will be sizes. within, the filter or a, a, there will be aeration provided somewhere, not necessarily in the tank itself, because you can put it in the components where it's recirculated. Yeah. But um, uh, like you mentioned before, I don't know who said it about the waterfall. So a lot of really small systems just have kind of that top filter bed or whatever, and it kind of falls into the, that's, if you have a couple fish in there, that's enough aeration. 
It's, that's plenty mm -hmm. for them. So you don't need a, another air stone set or anything like that. You yeah. have that mechanical. When you're agitating the surface of water, it takes in yeah. some oxygen. Mark, you have How do you feel about using um, tap water conditioner that you put your plant in high school? Tap water conditioner was the question. So they, they um, sell that and tote that <laughs> as like a slime protecting layer. Yeah. And I honestly like don't know. I'm not an expert on that, but um, it's basically, I would assume it's some sort of a salt in a liquid form. Uh, I, I don't know. It's sodium thiosulfate. It's sodium thiosulfate. Yeah, really That's what it is. It, like so it's put in a bottle, sold for a lot of money, where you can buy it very inexpensively. Yeah. I, I, I think well, our, I think our fifty pound bag is like ten bucks or yeah. something like that. So the thing I would say I would focus on uh, is your pH. Know the pH of your school because um, they can get pretty crazy um, and that's going to affect your system especially if you're doing bigger water changes know the ph of your water because you might need to adjust that before you know it that's that's a really easy one to do right away it doesn't change very often you'll like a lot of our teachers that previous workshop that we did um, a lot of them ran pretty high so just be aware of that something to check out so one one thing that just came to my mind was uh some municipalities use something other than chlorine. They use ammonia chloride um, to sterilize the drinking water. And so you can easily break that chlorine off, but what's it leave behind? Ammonia. So you have to watch that um, and check with your uh, city water and it's what they use. And you'll see it's that not, on your it's testing not, kit. It's not that common. Yeah, you'll see it on the testing kit. Yeah, yeah. just test some water straight out of where you're getting your water for your system, give you a baseline so you know what you're working with and then troubleshoot from there. We have seen, I, I, other states I've seen it much more common than here. But well, I mean, we were, I'm so sure we did fast in 2019 and we had everybody do a water test at their desk out of the drinking water that they were provided at the hotel and they were going to call it. Be aware. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Any, any other questions? Comments, experience folks want to share. Very much appreciate everybody sharing their, their experience. What did, um, I'm sorry, I don't know your name. Mark. Mark. Yes. Um, what did you do with the leftover waste? What am I still trying to figure out? I want my to get to it. <laughs> 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 Bio filtration is probably been one of my biggest problems. Um, most of this is me picking up stuff over the last couple of years. This is my first formal um, training, and that's been the biggest area. Um, I've done the black light um, to try to clear up the water for presentation purposes, but that solid waste is really like my biggest, mm -hmm. I guess, handicap. Mm -hmm. Great. So okay. the, the next easier step would be uh, versus these is a bag filter. Yeah. Well, I want to try um, the swirl filter. Swirl filter is trying work. to yeah. get it to where it's, like you said, it's working properly and everything collects so that we can go ahead and turn around and use the waste sensor. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. Yeah, acetylene tends to pretty, pretty good off. Yeah, slow flow. Yeah, a slow I mean, what I've done today is I've just reduced the number of fish, which makes it a lot easier to maintain. Fewer I fish, fewer and I was, I was getting crazy loss. So yeah. I just keep the right. regulation. Doesn't down, hurt so. to start low yeah. and then work your way up. Yeah. 